There we go. Well, welcome. If you're watching this on a replay, this is a free office hour that we offer to people who have paid for tutoring or paid for a class. Uh, we cap it at five. Uh, it is subject to change. And this has to be, has been moved around a couple of times because if there's somebody who wants to uh, do paid tutoring or something like that, which happened this week, we move it. Sometimes uh, you could end up being lucky like Kathy. Uh, Kathy's the only one here. And so she ends up basically getting a uh, free tutoring of an hour which it would be a $225 value. So uh, sometimes all five people show up, and in which case it's first come, first serve. Anyways, Kathy's taking her Series 66. And uh, as is typical, we say, what would you like to talk about in the office hour? And then we start knocking it out. And uh, she said analytical tools or analytic methods. Now, on your 65, 66, uh, as I was sharing with Kathy, this is not material to your success. If you tell me that you missed the 65 or 66 because of net present value or future value, I'm going to say you had bigger problems elsewhere. All right, so we're going to be talking about the time value money. And the first major concept is, Kathy, that money today is always worth more than money tomorrow. That's always, always going to be the case. We're also going to talk about a cocktail party trick called the rule of 72, which is kind of nice. Um you know, when I have people, sometimes I had a guy, he was buying tutoring for 65, 66. He said, Dean, I'm not going to pay you to do math with me. I'm a math guy. Any two numbers I can solve for the third. And I said, well, great. You know, I'm getting as he passed. But he said, Dean, they didn't ask me to bath. They asked me the formulas. I didn't spend enough time memorizing that. And I wasn't able to pick them out of the lineup, so to speak. So again, it's mainly, can you recognize the inputs and the outputs, right? So the future value a uh, formula determines the value of an investment made today, what it'll be worth in the future, given an assumed rate of return and based on a specified number of compounding periods. As I said, it's mainly do you understand the inputs and when you would use the math, not can you actually do the math? You know, can you pick this out of a lineup, right? So here it says future value equals the present value times one minus the assumed rate of return number of compounding periods. So, Kathy, the point here is if we assume a certain rate of return and we get better than that, we're going to end up getting to our financial destination sooner. And if we get less than that, we're going to get there a little later in terms of our time horizon. So here's a potential client that says, if I invest $10,000 today at 8% interest, what will it be worth in nine years? So again, inputs. The input is we have $10,000 today. We're assuming 8%, and it's nine years. That's the compounding time period. As I mentioned, it's not so much can you do this math. I'm going to show you the math. It's actually do you recognize, boom, the present value, the interest rate, and the compounding periods, right? And again, again, not again, can you come up with the number? But do you have a general understanding of the math? So in our example here, the present value was $10,000. The interest rate was 8%. And nine years was the number of compounding periods. Now, by the way, the other reason, Kathy, you can't do this is because on the test, they don't give you anything other than a simple function calculator. Right? So you don't have the, the calculator that's capable of doing this math, even if you could, right? So uh, well, now we come up with the answer. And again, that's mainly do you understand when we're using this is trying to figure out what this number would be if we could get that return in nine uh, years, the future value. And, you know, they might ask you about this in either direction. So present value. Uh, this determines the amount that would be needed to be invested today to grow at a specified amount in the future. Again, given assumed rate of return. It's not, can you do the math? It's do you recognize the formula? Can you pull this formula out of a lineup? Recognition. So here it says the future value, we're going to divide that by one plus the rate of return, the assumed rate of return in compounding periods. And what that's going to give us is present value, right? To go to a specified amount. So here's an example where this customer says, if I need $25,000, in 12 years. So I go, okay, so this must be present value. You know, one thing I do want you to be able to do, Kathy, is kind of make a decision about, are we being asked to go this direction? Let me just get out my annotation tool here. You know, we're going from a number into the future. 
are we taking the future number back, right? That's the distinction between what's going on in uh, terms of the math that we're doing, right? So here we're going the other way. Uh, if I need $25,000 in 12 years and I can get a 6% rate of return, how much do I have to invest today uh, to in, uh, reach this goal? And again, I told you, we do have to have a general understanding on why this person might need 25 grand in 12 years, right? Why would this math be something we would consider doing? Not that we're going to have to do it, but remember, maybe uh, there, he has a six-year-old kid and in eight to 12 years, the kid's going to be 18 and going to need to start college. And he wants to have $25,000 for college. Where you know, how much do I need for retirement? You know, that kind of a thing would be uh, lend itself well to this math. Now, as again, I said, it's not so much can you do the math, it's do you understand the inputs and the outputs of this? In other words, do you know what we need to solve the inputs? Do you recognize the formula? Not can you do it, you know, but can you have a general understanding of it? Right. So in this situation, I'm going to show you the math. And again, I said, you can't even do this if I asked you to do it because, you know, you have a simple function calculator on the test. But the future value input was 25. Interest rate was 6%. The number of discounting periods was 12 years. So boom, we end up getting the $12,424.23 is what we need today if we want 25 grand 12 years from today. And that's assuming that 6% return. So present value. Okay. Let's clean up our slide. So this is a neat kind of a cocktail party trick. I mean, this is kind of nice. So, you know, uh, you say, Dan, that Dean told me I wasn't going to have to do any of this math. And here I am looking at a math question. And I thought Dean promised me I wouldn't have to do this. You know, what you want to do is kind of take a strategic pause and say, okay, is there some kind of a hack available in terms of this math? And so the rule of 72 is kind of helpful because the rule of 72 allows us to take a percentage return and tell us how long it will take us to double our money. So, you know, if we take 72, for example, and we can get 10%, I just made that up. 72 divided by 10%. I'll just get my calculator. It takes us 7.2 years to double our money. You know, or 72 divided by 10 years would tell me I need 7.2% to double my money. So the rule of 72 is kind of a neat thing. So here's an example. Uh, we're trying to double 10 grand to 20 grand. So rule of 72 says, let's do it together, Kat. I think we're going to take our calculator. We're going to take 72. We're going to divide by four, and we find out that we would need 18 years to double our money. All right, well, again, we're using the rule of 72. Uh, we take 72, and we divide by three, and that would tell us that it would take us, uh, we need 24% to double our money. So be careful when you're looking at a question and there's some symmetry to it and maybe it's not a 72 rule. I have one, if you go to the channel and you put into the search bar, 72 rule of 72, I have a couple little videos. One I uh, really like, it's just a little lecture on the rule of 72, but the other is uh, a practice question where the guy uh, he wants to invest, he's 50, he wants to retire at 70 and he's got a hundred grand and he needs 400 grand. And then you say, okay, well, gee, if that's, 20 years and uh, he's got 100, he needs to double the money twice, doubles it to 200, doubles it to 400. And then you can use the rule of 72 to solve it, which I think is kind of a, an interesting example of uh, where we would use this in terms of the test. Uh, boom, uh, estimate 10,000 will double to 20, number of years, uh, 8%. And again, we had to show that to you earlier, right? If we take the rule of 72, and we divide by eight, we would have come up with that nine years, or we could, you know, input the, the, the years. All right, well, a lot of people freak out with this. So are you familiar, uh, Kathy, with the uh, teeter-totter seesaw? Um, 
bonds. Is that for the bonds? Yeah, where we have bonds and we look at the relationship of the bond trading at a discount or trading at a premium yes. and where the yields are in relation to each, to each other. Yes. You know, Kathy, uh, sometimes I get some serious bond geeks and they say, Dean, you know, I think that teeter-totter seesaw is so deceptive. I go, gee, why would you say that? I said, you know, I'm a big fan of the teeter-totter because the teeter-totter turns judgment questions into aim and shoot point and click questions. And anytime I can turn, uh, you know, a judgment question, aim and shoot, I'm all for that. I said, what do you find deceptive about that, you know, bond geek? And they said, well, Dean, that is a non-linear relationship. I said, I understand that. And it doesn't really go up and down like that teeter-totter does, but what do we care as long as we're getting right questions? You know, uh, the fancy word for volatility in a, a bond is duration. You know, so the bond guys get upset because they say, Dean, again, a lot of big words in this use analytical methods section of your test cat. You know, you don't want to get too bogged down. You know, they say it's like learning a foreign language. When you dream it, you know it. So I guess when you have your first analytical method dream, you're halfway home. <laughs> and remember, I started this by telling you there's only four questions here. But the nonlinear relationship of bond prices and their volatility interest rates is called convexity. Who cares? It's not a test term. Uh, but it's called duration, and that is a test term. And we will ask you on the exam, which bond has the highest duration? And all that means in simple English is volatility. And what we're going to do is go with long and low. We're going to go with the longest maturity first and then the lowest coupon. I'm going to show you how to use this to answer test questions in just a moment. I know you're excited. And the other thing we're going to be talking about here is what's called discounted cash flow. You know, uh, Mr. Buffett is a serious uh, fundamentalist uh, kind of a geek. You know, and Mr. Buffett uh, likes to do discounted cash flow on his Bank of America stock. You know, he knows that he's getting 21 cents every quarter, four times a year, he's getting 21 cents. And he knows that uh, he's going to get that forever. Or, you know, to do the math, maybe you can say, you know, it's going to end at some point. And then what he does is he says, I wonder what would be a fair value number, present value number for those future income streams. You know, he's going to do that calculation and based on that, decide on whether, you know, it's not the only determining factor, but whether he wants to buy more Bank of America stock. Why do you have 700 million directly from Bank of America, 300 second, uh, secondary market? So, you know, that's called the dividend discount model. That's when we're applying discounted cash flow to stocks. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. I'm not going to make you do it, but I am going to ask you to recognize, you know, fair value net present value, negative present value, whatever the case may be. And I'm sure yeah, we're going to do that in just a moment. Okay, so we said duration is a measurement of volatility. And we said that we're going to go long and low. So here's two bonds on your exam. And so you're on your exam, you're 66 or you're 65. And you say, okay, I'm being asked which bond is the most volatile, has the highest duration. So the first thing I'm doing is going with the longest maturity. As we see here, this bond matures in 2052. Whoops, sorry, let me get my... And this bond matures in 2042. So uh, they have the same coupon. So, you know, we don't have to look at the coupons here. And so we said the one that's going to be most volatile is the longest term. So that you would tell me on the test that those uh, bonds of 2052 have higher duration, longer duration, more volatility. Boom, boom, boom. That's the one. So we said long and low. We go longest maturity, lowest coupon. And duration is just the fancy word for volatility. Okay, so let's look at another one. So long and low. So again, now we go first, we look at maturity. First, we look at maturity. And this one is 2042. This one is 2042. Uh, this one is 6%. This one is 
So the one that's going to have the uh, longer or higher duration, more volatility, is the one with the lowest coupon. Again, long and low, long and low. All right, so boom, boom, boom. That is the winner in that game. This is the classical example of discounted cash flow. So you win the lottery. And they say, Kathy, you have a choice to take a lump sum or a series of payments for the next two de decades. And you say, man, this sounds like a math question. <laughs> now, I, I, Kathy, in the live stream, had somebody get really upset with me because I said, listen, in my career, I've had at times to do some math that was really, really important. And, uh, you know, I had a guy named Lee. Lee is my math guy. He's made tens of thousands of dollars doing math for Dean. Anyways, the guy on the live stream said, well, you shouldn't be in this business if you can't do your own math. I said, oh, my goodness, man, geez. You know, I don't think this, this person has any clue. There are all kinds of people in our industry who are very, very successful, who may choose not to do the math or don't know how to do the math and can hire the math guys. You know, these guys are for hire. So again, it's not, can you do the math? Is do you have a general understanding of the math? So I'm teasing Kathy, but what I would do is call Lee and say, hey, Lee, what should I do, man? Should I take the, uh, the lump sum or should I take the payments, right? So what we're going to figure out now, what is the present value of the future cash flows so that we can make this decision about whether we want the lump sum or not? Now, that, as I said, is the classical kind of example, but, you know, we're going to be uh, more concerned with, for example, uh, a series of payments that we may get from a bond, right? A bond pays semi-annually. Mm -hmm. And then at maturity, a bond gives me back my principal. So, you know, I might want to kind of consider whether or not, what do I think the future pay payments are worth today? What is the present value of the future cash flows in a bond particularly, in a bond particularly? Remember we said in stocks, when we're doing discounted cash flow or DCF, it's going to be called the dividend discount model. And if uh, Mr. Buffett assumes the dividend can grow, which it has, Bank of America, that would be called the dividend growth model. All right, let's look at an example here. Let's look at an example. So a bondholder paid 92 and a half. So you paid $925 for that bond, Gaffey. The bond pays you six and a half percent. So I'm going to take a thousand. I'm going to times it by six and a half percent. And that means this bond is paying $65 a year. Hmm. I'm going to divide that by two. And I say, Kathy, you're going to get $32.50 every six months for 10 years. Wow. So you're going to get 20 payments. 20 payments of 3250. You know, and the assumption is you can invest that 3250 and uh, maybe it will compound compound for you. You know, so it was the bond priced fairly. So again, what we wanted to look at is what is the present value? I'm not going to make you do the math. It'll be given information, but based on the math, is it a good deal or a bad deal? Is it overvalued or undervalued in terms of discounted cash flow in terms of this analysis? I mean, it's not the only thing we bring to the table. As I mentioned, Mr. Buffett doesn't only look at discounted cash flow, dividend growth model to decide whether by Bank of America. He does consider Brian Monahan's at the helm and uh, you know what does the U.S. Uh, industry look like, the economy, that kind of thing. But the present value of the future cash flows, and that would include the interest you're going to receive. We're receiving $32.50 every six months for the next 10 years. And the principal, remember, you're also going to get back $1,000. You pay $925 and you're getting back $1,000. So we uh, do the math, discounted cash flow, and we find out that those payments are worth $371. And the bond's principal value is going to be worth 553. Again, we don't have to do the math. But now we have discovered, and this is where, where it becomes testable. We have discovered that the present value of the future cash flows is 925.62. And this is what is testable. Not so much can you do the math. Who cares about the math? Yeah, it looks like we got a good deal. And it looks like we got a good deal because test question 
we have positive net present value. Positive, meaning we paid 921.25 and the present value of the future cash flows. And what we would say is this was a good value, right? Again, given information. You're not going to have okay. to crunch this. It's given information. But what if you had paid for the bond instead? You had paid for the bond 92 and 7 eighths. Now, remember how you turn that into dollar amount? You take your calculator. You take 7, divide by 8, and then you times it by a bond point, and that's 875. And so here, what if you would have paid, let's put that in here, if we would have paid 928.75, you know, again, we still may want the bond, but what we're asking is based on discounted cash flow analysis, is it overvalued or undervalued or fairly valued? So now it looks like we have negative net present value, right? We paid 928.75, and the math suggests that the present value is 925.62. And so if it has a negative net present value, we're going to say it is overvalued. You know, kind of basically in plain English, good deal or bad deal based on discounted cash flow analysis. Again, not going to make you do the math. I'm just going to ask you to compare and have a general understanding of what this is in terms of either being a good value or not based on the math, right? That's boom. And this is would be undervalued or good value, and this would be a bad value. Not going to make you do the math. All right, so uh, you also uh, get tested. Analytical methods is what we're talking about. We said there's only four questions here, Kathy, and I'm not going to do... get one of these. <laughs> well, you know, and then, the, you know, of these four questions, uh, some of them are going to be balance sheets, working capital and current ratio and that kind of thing. I'm not going to go over that with you today. We can do that at a future office, however you'd like. So I'm just going to do the front part of the analytical methods, which is the stuff that most people kind of freak out about. But all right, so you are going to have to do a simple average on the exam. A simple average. That's what you do is you just total up all the numbers and you divide, and that's the average. I don't think you'll see it as a mean. I think the way to last this for you is in what we call, Kathy, dollar cost averaging where they're going to say your client's investing $100 every quarter. In the first quarter of the stock, uh, the mutual fund has a public offering price of five, then 10, then five, then 10. And then you got to come up with, you know, the average price. And then you got to come up with the average cost. And, uh, you know, th that kind of thing. I think that's where you're going to see it. I don't really think you're going to see it in this kind of a scenario. Uh, but here over the past seven years, a security has produced annual returns of 10%, 4%, negative five percent you know i had a guy who asked me do i have to, to take into account the negative performance i go absolutely <laughs> that really happened. You, don't, <laughs> you don't get to toss out any negative numbers absolutely not so ten percent twelve percent two percent six percent and then the test asks you to calculate the average the mean so all we do here is we add up all these numbers you know 10 and 4 is 14 minus 5 is 9 plus 10 is 19 plus 12, if I add up all those numbers, I get 35. And there were in the data set was one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I divide and I get the mean of 5%. So that was the average return. And again, I think you're going to have to do that. I don't think it will be phrased quite this way. Okay, what's another thing? Again, we're talking about analytical methods. You know, the median. I always think when I think median, I say, stay off the median. You know, my mom is retired. I take care of mom. She's still capable of driving, but, you know, she does worry me sometimes. She told me the other day she was driving on the median and she didn't even know it. I'm like, mom, I wish, you know, please, I'll give you a ride. If it's, you know, you need to go somewhere, just let me know and I'll drive Miss Daisy, right? But the median is the middle, right? That's what the median is. And the median in the road is the middle of the road. Over the past seven years, a security has produced annual returns of 10%, 4%, negative 5%, 10%, 12%, 2%, and 6%. Calculate the median. You know, where is the middle? 
So, you know, the way I kind of think of this is the middle. Uh, I don't know if it's helpful, but I kind of think of like a thermometer. And I like to think, well, gee, you know, if I'm starting at negative five, five below zero, and then things warm up, and now it's 12, uh, 12 degrees above zero, you know, that move, that entire move, you know, would be the middle. The middle number in the set is 6%. So calculate the median, and it would be the middle number, which in this case is 6%. Okay, so now the other thing we have to do sometimes is in the range, right? And I told you the way I like to look at the range. Well, it looks like I'm a little out of sequence here. My apologies. Uh, mode is the one that happens the most often. Pretty straightforward. And that's 10%. And then this last one is the range. So uh, here's my thermometer example, right? So negative 5 to 12 degrees. So that's a, what, a 17-point move. And so we were looking at my thermometer example. We're going all the way from five to 12. And so, you know, that halfway and that movement in this data set would be three and a half, right? Because eight and a half is the half, right? 17 points, half of that's eight and a half. So we go up eight and a half degrees from negative five. It's now three and a half degrees. So I don't know if you find that thermometer analogy helpful, but, you know, that's why I think if I have friends from Minnesota, and I, I don't go there as often. I don't tell them. It doesn't hurt my heart that I don't go there any, as much as I used to. But they say, oh, it's warming up. I go, are you ridiculous? What the heck are you talking about? They say, well, Dean, it used to be negative five, and now it's 12 above zero. I'm like, oh, my God, you guys are crazy. All right, so alpha and beta. Alpha and beta. Uh, I think you can get away with a simple version of this, Kathy, on your test. What I mean by a simple version is oversimplified. I'm oversimplifying this. But if I told you the market return was 10%, uh, the market return, this is testable, is the S&P 500. And I told you we were buying a stock with a beta of one and a half. That means this uh, security is one and a half times as volatile as the market. And again, this is given information. I, you definitely should know that beta is a measurement of a security's volatility as compared to the market as a whole. On the test, they might use the phraseology, what is my expected return? And my expected return would be 15%. So if I come to you, Kathy, uh, let's say this is, uh, you know, the security, we bought the security as a 1.5% beta. And I am calling it and I'm chatting it up. I say, hey, Kathy, look at that security, man. We made 14%. The market only went up uh, 10 and we made 14. You say, Dad, Dean, are you really chatting up a 14% return on a security with a beta one and a half? And I said, gee, you're no fun. He said, well, Dean, we were kind of expecting, you know, 15%. So based on a beta one and a half, we've actually underperformed. You know, now I might uh, have reason to chat up 18%. I say, hey, Kathy, I got us excess return. I got us my, uh, something over beta. What do we call the excess return over beta? That is uh -huh. called, that's right. And the alpha here is 3%. Uh, by the way, the alpha could be negative two. Here, you know, that it was negative one on a 14%. You know, seeking alpha means I'm seeking excess returns. You know, and there are some people that don't believe there's such a thing as an excess return. There are some people who believe in the efficient market. And there, there's no such thing as alpha. And so you should just accept the market-based return. All right, now let me show you the more complicated math version of this. So again, my math friends would be very upset with what I just showed you there. Because they, they'd say, Dean, you didn't take into account the risk-free rate of return. I said, well, you know, I think it's simple enough to get the uh, questions right we need on the 65, 66. Uh, you definitely should know the definition of beta. You know, beta is a measurement of systematic risk, specifically market risk. And I told you it's very testable to know that's measured as measured by the S&P 500. Uh, uh, beta measures the variability, volatility, variable, variability, volatility,
between a particular stock's movement and that of the market in general. So risk associated with beta. An investment has an average amount of risk. That would be a beta one. An investment has above average uh, amount of risk or volatility. Would that be a higher beta or a lower beta if it has above average risk and volatility? You tell me, Kathy. Above? You're correct. The investment has a below average amount of risk or volatility. Below. Yeah. No, and again, your risk tolerance would be important. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe you say, Dean, I really, uh, be honest with you, I, I have plenty of time to get my destination and I'm willing to accept, uh, I don't want to expect a market volatility. I could get you something that's like 0.5. And then 0.5 would, would be the expectation, Kathy, that in up markets, we underperform because the market goes up 10%, we only go up five. Or, but the good news, when the market goes down 10, we only go down five, right? So, you know, we could have something even less volatile. Uh, alpha, we said, is the excess return. Comparing the actual return, in my example, 18% to the expected return, in my example, 15%. So in the example I showed you, the oversimplified version I showed you, our actual return was higher than the expected return. So we had positive alpha. And I also showed you a return that was less than our expected return. And I told you that alpha could be both positive and negative. You know, and boy, this would be you know, embarrassing, right? If the beta equals the alpha, <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, then, you know, I haven't earned my money, so to speak. Okay, so you're not going to have to do this. Again, it's a general understanding of input and output, input and output. So the risk-free rate of return, Kathy, is whatever we assume to do the math. Right. And so we're assuming here that without hazarding our capital, without hazarding our capital, we could have got 3%. That's what you get for not playing any game. Uh, stock A has a beta of one. So, you know, the kind of the trick on the test now is that will be our stocking horse for market return because to say stock A has a beta one means it moves with the market. And so that's going to be what we call our market return. Stock B has a beta 1.4. Stock A had a return of 13%. Now, the reason that, that was important for us as a test taker is because, boom, now we know that the market return was 13% because, remember, stock A moves with the market. So that was important. Stock B had a return of 19%. What is stock B's alpha? Now, I'm not going to make you crunch this. I just want you to have a general understanding of it. The oversimplified version I gave you will work. But the actual math that you won't have to do, I just did a debrief the other day. Guy said he used his calculator once. Uh, I had a really great debrief uh, this morning. I'll share it next Tuesday on the live stream. Boy, this guy, crazy. I mean, you know, he's a dean while I was still fresh. Let me tell you some of the stuff I, I saw. Anyway, so here's our expected return. We're going to take the uh, market return of 13%. The reason we're minusing the three is because, remember, three is what we could have got without having our capital. So we really only got 10, right? Because we could have got the three without doing anything. Okay. We uh, times it by 1.4. And so we're expecting uh, 14%, right? I don't think you have to worry about the risk-free rate of return, but that. But the actual return and access to the risk-free rate return. Now, again, I'm going to minus it again, because remember that 19, we could have got three without doing anything. You know, that would be like T-bills or money market or whatever it happens to be. And so indeed, we did have some uh, alpha here. We had alpha. The alpha is 2%. Standard deviation, variance, variance, a statistical term. This definition is testable. I had somebody just point blank told me they got asked the definition. It's a statistical term that measures the amount of variable, variability, variance, uh, dispersion around an average, and the volatility of an investment projected returns computing historical performance data. And so here's company A. We had a 5% return, 15% return, 10% return. 
Here's company B, negative two, 10%, 22%. Wow. Now, you know, statistically, I'm an MBA fan. And so, Kathy, you know, when we do the uh, points, the average points our player has, I have a player A who uh, gave me five points a game. Next game, he gave me 15 points. Third game, he gave me 10 points. And I have another player who gave me negative two. He had turnovers. He didn't get anything done. Then he scored 10 points and he scored 22 points. Both those players scored on their average 10. You know, these returns both averaged 10. However, stock B has more volatility, right? It has more volatility. It has more variance, you know, standard deviation. Now, here's a graph of what that looks like. You know, companies A, the dispersion of the returns are more tightly within that bell-shaped curve. Whereas company B, woo, right? A lot more volatility. Now, again, you know, volatility is neither good or bad. It just is what it is, right? You know, so, you know, in my sports analogy, I have to decide, am I paying, pay, paying this guy based on what he truly does each and every year was this a year he just you know scored 22 points when he usually does it right so again that's called uh, standard deviation a uh, very very testable correlation so positive correlations are stocks that move in the same direction now i may decide that i want to do this kathy but under modern portfolio theory I wouldn't be accomplishing much if I put both Chevron and Exxon into your portfolio. So there's already Chevron in your portfolio and I add Exxon. You know, I may do that because I think the oil industry is a place for us to be, but we're not talking about that. We're talking about modern portfolio theory. And under modern portfolio theory, that doesn't provide your portfolio with diversification because the correlation to Chevron and Exxon is very strong. You know, I would think like Lowe's and Home Depot, right? Sometimes I can't even tell if I'm in a Lowe's or Home Depot. I have to ask somebody. I say, oh, yeah, these are the orange apron. You guys are the Home Depot guys, right? Now, in terms of diversification, what we want to do is we want to try and add something that will go the opposite direction. So I have a Chevron in your portfolio. And now I add Delta, an airline company. You know, so now if oil prices go up, jet fuel prices go up, that would be good for Chevron, but that would be bad for Delta. If a jet fuel oil prices go down, that would be good for Delta, but it'd be bad for Chevron. You know, these two securities have negative correlation. Now, they're not going to give you examples here. They're just going to give you a number, whether it's, you know, negative one or one, right? And then you have to say, which one would provide the additional diversification? And you would say, okay, I need to pick the one that has the negative correlation. Perfect correlation. I don't think my Chevron Exxon is going to be perfect. I don't think my Home Depot Lowe's will be perfect, but it'll be pretty damn close in terms of how those securities move in the marketplace, right? You know, you're never going to get perfect correlation. I got upset with a doctor client of mine once because I wanted him to buy a put. And the reason I was upset he didn't do it is because it had perfect correlation to the stock. As the stock came down, this would go up and it would be perfect negative correlation. Zero correlation means there's no discernible pattern. There's no discernible pattern. So again, here is my example that I just showed you. Uh, I showed you stock A and stock B. I gave you Chevron and I gave you Exxon. And as we said, that didn't, uh, you know, uh, give us much diversification. And what we're looking for is things that have negative correlation. And so if I'm trying to reduce risk and add diversification, instead of adding Chevron, I said what we might want to consider doing is adding a stock that has different correlation. Different correlation. And so maybe I add, in my example, I added Delta. You know, this is all part of... Uh, you know, it's not testable. Professor Markowitz, you know, is the guy who invented modern portfolio theory. And he's, you know, the guy who came up with all this kind of math stuff we're talking about. 
Okay. Uh, on the test, they don't use the word inverse correlation. They use the term negative correlation. Zero, again, boom, no correlation. Perfect correlation. Okay, well, I'm going to stop there. Uh, not because, uh, you know, it's, uh, we have 15 minutes more in our free office hour account. But the reason I'm starting stopping is because when you're doing this stuff, you want to, you know, um, make sure you don't do too much because your brain gets tired and you can't do it. Now, I told you this entire uh, thing called analytical method is four questions, and you're very likely to get more questions on the balance sheet, working capital, current ratio, uh, you know, uh, quick ratio, debt to total capital, uh, P, and I have separate videos on balance sheets that you certainly can watch. Okay. Uh, but I think that's a pretty good coach uh, coaching call or, you know, office hour, probably called a coaching call just because it's just you and me. But, you know. No, yes, definitely. And I did. Um, so I, I was able to walk through these notes with you.